Well, I want to welcome you to our 945 service. I'm Peter Salmon. I'm our lead pastor here at Trinity Bible Church, and it's so good to be with you here uh, this morning. I'm really excited to unpack uh, the section of Luke chapter 1 that uh, we're going to tackle here this morning. But first, I want to share with you just a couple uh, things, a couple changes that are taking place just in our Sunday morning kids ministry. And um, these are some pretty significant changes and some changes that we've been working on for a long time here at Trinity. So I want to take just a moment here at the beginning of our service and share that with you. Uh, first off, just for a little bit of context, uh, we put together a, a vision retreat about a year ago, and some of our staff and shepherding board and, and key leaders came together and just prayed about and sought to discern where is God leading us? What are some great opportunities that we have as a church for where God could take us? And, and just one of the key opportunities that we felt we needed to invest in was Sunday morning kids ministry. And uh, we felt like the content is amazing, the depth is amazing, and our volunteers are amazing, but we needed to engage more volunteers. And we need to implement some security procedures just as we grow and some new policies in, in, in place. And so we put together a team uh, from that retreat of just highly invested leaders, of uh, highly invested volunteers led by Pastor Tony Wilshire. Uh, pastor Trent, our kids pastor, uh, who's been here since September, he also joined that team. Uh, once he uh, came on board in September. And this team has been working hard behind the scenes uh, just to put some of these things in place and to, to think about and, and discern what changes might be needed. And I want to share with you just real briefly some of the changes that they've uh, has been, have been approved and suggested to the shepherding board and approved by our shepherding board. Uh, first, we're adding an identical hour of kids ministry uh, during the 11 a.m. service. Uh, right now, new families tend to gravitate towards the 945 service because we have kids ministry during that hour. Uh, but the problem with our 945 service is that it's the one that's most consistently uh, full and even maxed out some Sundays. So we need to open up another option for new families at 11 a.m. Now, I want to mention that, as always, we welcome kids in our service. And it's never intended that a Sunday morning kids ministry would be a replacement for Sunday morning worship for families. We love the idea of families worshiping together, and our family does every week. Our, my wife and I and our two-year-old and four-year-old, and, and I love the fact that our two-year-old last night driving home uh, from Aaron's in the back seat, he's singing Build My Life, uh, one of the songs that we've sung. And then Paul, uh, to his grandma the other day, uh, told her one of my lame Thanksgiving jokes. And uh, I never told it to him before, but he picked it up from the sermon, and I think there's other things he's probably picking up too, hopefully. Um, than just his dad's lame jokes. But uh, we love the idea of families worshiping uh, together. But we do sense a need to add another opportunity uh, for new families and for the families of our ones by opening up an opportunity at 11 a.m. for kids ministry through fifth grade. And so secondly, along with that, we're shifting the format of Sunday morning kids ministry for age five, four uh, through fifth grade, just to lighten the load on volunteers and to engage more volunteers who have different schedules and different skill sets. Our curriculum won't change. The Gospel Project is a curriculum we love and will continue to use. Uh, we want to have the same content as before, but we're going to also add a, a large group time element in it. And uh, that'll involve, uh, there will be music that'll be incorporated into that. And um, that'll be something new for a lot of our kids in that age range um, during that time and uh, it'll engage kids just in a different way than we are now. And then we'll have a large group teaching time, um, and we'll have kind of the benefit of that will be that we'll have uh, kind of one large group teacher that's really focused in preparing for that time every single week. After that large group time is over, then kids will go to their age-specific small group classes, much like we have now, and then their small group teachers will continue um, that teaching uh, from whatever area of the Bible they're in, uh, kind of continue that teaching for the next 35 to 40 minutes. So it kind of is a divide and conquer approach, just kind of lightening the burden, lightening the load on volunteers and helping volunteers just focus on their specific aspect of what they're teaching uh, that morning. And so we believe this will help us, uh, again, lighten the load on volunteers, engage more volunteers, and it will help us to uh, have smaller class sizes, which is uh, kind of an ultimate goal uh, along the way of this. Just, you know, right now we have 12, 15, 17 kids in a class, and just by having smaller class sizes with more volunteers, where the load's lightened on volunteers, uh, we can uh, engage kids at a more personal level, at a more relational uh, level, as we seek to now, but it's difficult uh, with large classes. A ton more details with that. If you want more information, I can give it uh, to you, or Pastor Trent can give it to you. Uh, third thing, third change, is that we're adding a name to our Sunday morning kids ministry. Right now we call it Sunday School, which isn't a biblical name. It isn't a uh, sacred name. 
so we want to give our kids' ministry kind of an identity, much like uh, a lot of our other ministries that have names, uh, Awana and uh, Genesis and Peacemakers even. Uh, there's a lot of different ministries we have in this church that have a, a name, and that kind of gives it its own sense of identity. And so the name that our kids' ministry team adopted is uh, Treehouse Kids. Uh, all throughout the Bible, we see that picture and visual of a tree used to describe our life with God, uh, that we're called to be in Psalm 1, a tree planted by streams of water. In Colossians 2, 7, it talks about being rooted in Christ. And so with that, we really feel like that, that name of Treehouse Kids can better communicate what uh, kids' ministry at Trinity is about. And so with that name, Treehouse Kids, our tagline, we say, is that we want kids to be rooted in Christ and growing in love. Rooted in Christ and growing in love. And that's how we can articulate much better um, just kind of what the purpose is of this ministry on Sunday morning. Now, these changes are all going to be start, starting to be implemented starting in January. And uh, just a couple things you can do to help. Number one, pray. Uh, pray for the leaders uh, that are recruiting, training volunteers. Uh, pray for the new volunteers that are going to sign up this morning at the little, uh, there's a little card in your uh, pocket, and you can pray for those volunteers that are going to take that card out, and they're going to sign it. And I'm just kidding. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, you can pray for volunteers. You can pray for Pastor Trent just as he seeks to implement some of these things. And then um, pray also um, just for continued growth in our kids and in our kids' ministry. We love ministering to the next generation. I love being a part of a church that's all generations here and helping one another walk with Jesus. Uh, and then uh, another thought is just if there are any that would want to move their kids from the 945 hour to the 11 a.m. hour, we need uh, some kids kind of to, to, to seed that service in a way with a critical mass of, of kids just in that hour. Uh, so, from here, I'm going to invite Pastor Trent up and then any members of our Kids Ministry Task Force that are here this morning. Uh, all right, come on up. And uh, they're just going to share with you a little bit more. And Jeremy, can I get a mic up here? Or which one should I use? Okay. Yes. So, uh, these are some of the folks that have been kind of working hard on all these things behind the scenes. And I just want to have you hear from them just in a very personal way, what this ministry means to them, what they're seeing, what kind of fruit they're seeing from it, and then uh, just what it's like uh, to be a part of it even. And Dee will be able to share more along those lines. So Mallory, share with us from like a parent perspective what it's like to have uh, children in this ministry. Okay, I'm... Okay, I'm Mallory Riggs. Um, I have been a part of the Children's Ministry Task Force, and it has really been a joy to me to see how much this church values children. Um, and as a parent, I'm thankful to be part of a church that loves kids, and my kids are being taught the Bible in its entirety. Um, it's not just isolated stories. Each week with the Gospel Project, they have a Christ connection that has every story last week we learned about Jeremiah and drawing that back to Jesus. I love that. Um, it really helps me as a parent at home um, just to continue those conversations. Um, I'm also thankful as a parent to have other adults in my kids' life who are praying for them, who care about them sincerely. I've been stopped um, multiple times out in the foyer weeks after one of my kids gave a prayer request to follow up and just say, hey, Asher had us praying about this. How's that going? I just love that there are adults that care about my kids. Um, I'm excited about some of the changes that we're making because it will just um, add to that relational aspect if we have smaller group sizes teachers will be, really be able to get to know um, the kids better. And last week, I got to sit on, in on the large group, and uh, Pastor Trent taught it. And he had kids from kindergarten to fifth grade acting out the story. They were engaged. There was laughter, but there was also a lot of depth. And when we got back and talked in our small groups, the kids understood the story. Um, it was just a really fun, engaging way. So I have been teaching now for, I think, four years, a little over, and I absolutely love my kids. If you ask a teacher, it depends on the class of what the win is going to look like in their class. So um, in the two- and three-year-olds, you might have a win of they didn't eat any crayons today. <laughs> um, <laughs> or um, in the fifth graders, if you were to talk to... Trent Simpson, you would hear that he has a question box, 
and in the question box, they're allowed to ask any question they want. And then they look it up and say, what, what does the Bible say about that? Um, he said one of his, actually it was one of his own kids, a five-year-old, said, God, why did God create man if he knew he was going to sin? So if you look in the fifth grade, fourth and fifth grade class, your wins are going to look a little bit different. In my class, um, I wanted to share with you that the first year I taught, Addie Colson was in my class, and she was getting ready to go to Australia. So we started putting missionary kids' pictures up on the wall, and every Sunday we pray for one missionary kid and one pastor's family here in our church. And so, and then when I went to Africa, they put my picture up and prayed. It was, I love my kids. And the hardest thing about going to Africa was what was going to happen to my kids when I wasn't here. So um, God provided, and somebody stepped in and did just fine with them. But you need to know that the teachers that are back there love your kids. And there's nothing more important to them than seeing them rooted in Jesus and growing in Christ and in love. So um, just one little quick story of what happened this year. Uh, I started to tell the kids that I'm going back to Africa, and there were two little girls who came in, and they handed me an envelope. To Each one had an envelope. Each one had drawn me a picture, and there was money inside that envelope. And they said this was for Africa. So even... I'm sure that was the parents teaching, it, but it was their lemonade stand money. And they put that money aside and wanted it to go to Africa. So for me, that was a huge win because they were learning what a missionary is here at home and abroad. So thanks. Yeah, I, I love that story from Didi and just how uh, the kids are learning about missionaries and and what it means to you know, share the gospel with others. And, and Mallory has a great teacher and parent perspective of, of how and what's going on in our kids' ministry and how those conversations can continue at home. And, and so I'm super excited for all that God is doing now in our kids' ministry. And I'm excited looking forward, and I'm certain God will continue to move and impact the lives of our kids and our teachers and, and our church through our kids' ministry. And I would love for you to be a part of that, so I would love to invite you into our kids' ministry here at, at Trinity for Treehouse Kids. As Peter already mentioned, there's a little card in your seat back pocket. If there's not one, there are some at the kids' check-in just right back here behind the wall. Um, and on there, there's different, different check boxes of the different roles that we have needs for coming in January. Um, so if you feel God tugging on your heart and you want to be a part of impacting the next generation and helping kids be rooted in Christ, growing in love, you can fill out your contact information and just check the boxes that you'd be interested in serving and learning more about, and then I will be in contact with you about what that would look like and the more specifics of, of those roles in the coming, coming days. Um, and Peter already mentioned that another way that you can help out would be switching your kids from the 9.45 to the 11 a.m. hour if you choose. And if you're willing to do that, you can just put your name, your contact information, and you can write 11 a.m. on the bottom of that card, and we'll be in contact about uh, what that would look like. And, um, if there's a different way that you want to serve in Treehouse Kids that might not be on here, feel free to write that in there. I met with someone the other day about creating a stage for our large group time because he really likes to work with wood, so I'm really excited about that. So there's many opportunities, and so if there's something that's not on here that you would be interested in, feel free to write that as well, and we'd, we'd love to have you on our team at Treehouse Kids. Awesome. Let's thank this team for all their great uh, work here for us. Let me pray for us, and we'll get into the message this morning. God, we just thank you again that, that we can be a church that has all generations here represented, even in this service, God, just to be your people. And um, thank you that we have the opportunity and the privilege of stewarding even children and raising them up um, to, to understand who you are and uh, to direct their path in the way that they should go. And so uh, thank you for that opportunity. We just pray right now for the volunteers, for the teachers, for the kids that are in our uh, kids' wing and uh, where that ministry is actively happening. We pray that you bless them and bless uh, the teaching and learning of God's word that's happening right now. And God, I pray as we uh, open up your word, just that you would illuminate our hearts, illuminate our eyes to 
uh, some stories in Luke chapter 1 that are maybe somewhat familiar for some of us. If we've been around the church for a long time, maybe we've heard these stories on different Christmases or different Advent seasons, but pray that you would open up our eyes anew to see Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been in a series called Waiting for Christmas, where we're really kind of opening up our study of Luke's gospel. Uh, We're in Luke chapter 1. Right now, you can go ahead and turn there in your Bible if you want to follow along. Uh, But we're opening up our study of Luke 1, and Luke is all about the kingdom of God and God establishing his kingdom and sending his king into the world, sending this king who had been promised uh, throughout the whole Old Testament, and that promise coming to fulfillment at Christmas, at the birth of Jesus. And so last week, we saw the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah and how God sent John the Baptist. Um, And there was a miraculous birth that took place uh, since Elizabeth and Zechariah weren't able to have kids and God blessed them and they were able to have uh, a child, John the Baptist. But in this story that we're going to see today, we're going to see a little bit of a different uh, different situation. We're going to see a woman who isn't anticipating having children. And we're going to see that, that when the kingdom of God breaks into her life, it doesn't end a season of waiting like it did for Elizabeth, but it brings her into a new season of waiting. We're going to see this in Luke chapter 1, like I said, starting in verse 26. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. So, so Mary was this young woman who was sitting at home and planning her wedding, essentially. It says she was engaged to a man named Joseph. Now, it wasn't a normal kind of engagement that we might understand in our culture in the 21st century. Uh, engagements as a first century Jewish woman uh, kind of looked like this. Your family would get together, your parents would get together, and they would decide who you're going to marry. And then the groom's parents would pay a bride price to the father of the bride. Now, for the dads of daughters here in the room, uh, you're thinking, hey, uh, so let me get this straight. Like, I get to pick who marries my daughter, and I get paid for it. Yes, that is correct. That was the system. You're thinking, hey, this doesn't sound half bad. Um, but, but this was the system. And, and so once that arrangement was made, once that betrothal was made, they were pledged to each other. And that time of being pledged to each other lasted for about a year. Now, during that year, uh, the, the bride and the groom, uh, they were, in, for uh, all intents and purposes, married, except they lived separately and weren't, allowed to, weren't permitted to have sexual relations with each other. Um, so for all intents and purposes, other than that, they were married legally and before God and all of that, and, and then and there was, uh, the, the, the marriage couldn't end except for divorce or death. So during this year-long period of time of being pledged to one another, this was a time of, of testing, really, the purity of this couple. And if the, the, the bride became pregnant during that time, and especially if, if then the, 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 the groom would divorce her or annul the marriage, it was assumed that she'd been unfaithful to the relationship. And so this is kind of the period of time that uh, Mary is in. She's this unassuming young woman. She's living at home. She's planning her wedding. And then an angel appears and says, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Now, Mary wonders why the angel is greeting her this way. She has no significance or no particular status in society. But the angel appears to her, and she wonders what's going on here. The angel tells her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. Now there are many similarities between the story of Mary and the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. They both have an angel appear to them. They both have miraculous births that are promised. But one of the differences is that while Elizabeth is going to bear a son who will make way for this great king that's to come into the world, Mary's son, Jesus, will be that great king. In verse 32, the angel says, he will be great. He'll be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. This was the king that had been prophesied about all throughout the Old Testament, this king that would come into the world and establish this new kingdom that would have no end, as it says here. 
And this was the king that God's people had been waiting for and that God's people had been longing for. But there's one little problem. Unlike Elizabeth, Mary is, at this point, unmarried. She's a virgin. And she, so she has some questions, as I'm sure that all of us would. Mary asked the angel, how can this be, since I have not had sexual relations with a man? Now, if this question sounds familiar, it's because it sounds a lot like the question that Zechariah asked to the angel when the angel appeared to him earlier in Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, verse 18, Zechariah says, how can I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. So we could wonder, will Mary be disciplined by the angel in the same way that Zechariah was disciplined by the angel? Because when Zechariah asked his question, he was caused to be silent for the next nine months until his son John was born. But as we look at these questions a little bit closer, Zechariah says, how can I know this? As if he can't really take the angel's word for it. He needs another sign. He needs more proof of what's happening here. And it shows unbelief, really. It shows that he doesn't believe God. Mary's question is slightly different. Her question is, how can this be? She's not asking for a sign, but rather she's asking for a little bit of uh, biological uh, clarification here. Mary's question doesn't come out of cynicism. It doesn't come out of skepticism or unbelief, but rather from an astonishment at the fact that God has chosen her, a virgin, to bear this child. In the next verse, the angel answers her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. What this angel is describing is a miraculous virgin birth. Now, there's been miraculous births all throughout the Bible. But but this kind of miracle is different. It's on a whole other level of difficulty here. Now, for some of you, you're thinking, Okay, slow down for a minute. I was on board until now. This whole thing of a virgin birth, it just seems a little hard to believe. It seems a little far-fetched. Well, let me give you a couple thoughts to consider. First of all, this concept of a virgin birth hadn't ever even been conceived of up to this point, pun intended. Uh, No one had ever thought of this before. No one had ever even considered that this was something God would do. In fact, it was only after the fact that Christians looked back at the scriptures and looked at a verse like Isaiah 7.14 uh, and, and saw that this had been prophesied. Isaiah 7.14 said, Therefore the Lord uh, himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. But at this point, the Jews always interpreted this as being a woman of marriageable age who would have a baby by natural means. They didn't think uh, it'd be, of it being a literal virgin birth. So skeptics think that well, Luke just made this up here to kind of uh, make this a greater story than it really is. But how dumb would Luke have to be to add a virgin birth into this story if a virgin birth wasn't even part of the requirement for being the promised Messiah? I mean, what is he thinking if that's what he's doing here? Is Is he just dense if he's making this story harder to believe than it is already? We know that Luke is no dummy. He was a medical doctor. He knew perfectly well how babies are made. And uh, it, it, it would have been just as hard for him to believe in a virgin birth as it would be for anyone today. Other skeptics say, well, you know, Luke wasn't purposefully trying to mislead anybody. It was just like, you know, this story was told kind of like a game of telephone from one person to the next to the next to the next. And finally, it got so exaggerated and so blown out of proportion that when Luke sat down to write it, here's what he wrote. But we know from Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, that Luke was a painstaking historian, that he interviewed eyewitnesses to the life of Jesus. And many researchers and many scholars believe that he actually interviewed Mary herself as he wrote Luke chapter 1. And so maybe the best explanation for this uh, reporting of a virgin birth is that it's true, that this is how it actually happened. And for us as Christians, it's not far-fetched to believe this because the, the God that spoke the universe into existence could certainly create a, womb, a baby in Mary's womb. It turns out that God knows what he's doing because in this uh, reality of a virgin birth, 
we can understand that this was necessary and vital to who Jesus was. Because Jesus was born of a woman, but conceived by the Holy Spirit, Jesus was then both fully man and fully God. And if he wasn't both of these things, then our salvation would be a virtual impossibility. Because understand, if Jesus was just man, but not divine, then he'd be just like the rest of us. Then how could he save us? How could he be the solution to our problems? He would have been part of the problem. And on the other hand, if Jesus was only divine and had no human nature, he wouldn't be able to represent us perfectly and fully before God. He wouldn't even be able to relate to our struggles and our pain. The virgin birth wasn't just God showing off his power. It had to happen so that we could be saved. It was the only way that we could be saved. Because not only was Jesus fully man, intimately acquainted with our lives, with our pain, with our sufferings, with our trials, with our temptations, but he was fully God and he was able to overcome these things. He was able then to live a perfect, sinless life and to be a perfect, spotless sacrifice for our sins at the cross. He was able to represent us perfectly before a holy God and bear our sins upon himself. He was able to live the life that we couldn't live, and he was able to die a death that only he could die in our place for our sins. And so the virgin birth is is vital to our faith because it set the stage for everything that he would accomplish in his life. And so, you know, during this time of Christmas, we think of, you know, sweet little baby Jesus just, you know, in the manger there in our nativities and, and in the Christmas cards and different things, and we look at him in the manger, but, but do we realize that he was like custom built for our salvation? He, he was custom fit for a cross. That he was designed and dreamed up by God before the foundation of the world, always ever existing, begotten by God for this purpose, the only one equipped to be our Savior. And skeptics attempt, attempt to scrutinize uh, the virgin birth, you know, you, and you can scrutinize it from, from 20 different angles if you want. But I want you this morning to see the beauty of this, to see the beauty of what God did to provide a way that we could be saved, the only way that we could be saved. God was willing to show his love for us to the extent of being willing to send his son to us. God, but in the form of a man, so that he could die for the sins of the world. God didn't want heaven without us, so he sent heaven to us. God didn't want to be God without us, so he sent God to us. And this is the beauty of the virgin birth, that apart from this kind of birth, apart from Jesus being fully God and fully man, this would not have been possible. This is the only way that we could be saved. And it involved God sacrificing his only son. And he was willing to do that for you. He was willing to do that for your sins, for your salvation, so you could be forgiven, so you could be welcomed home to God. Do you see the beauty of what God did in Jesus Christ? God provided a way for all of us to be saved. And and if you haven't received that salvation, And you can do that this morning. It's as simple as just admitting to God and acknowledging to God and saying, God, I know I fall so far short of your design and your intent for my life. In other words, I know I've sinned. And then just saying, God, I believe in who you are. I believe that you were that sacrifice sufficient for my salvation, perfect, spotless, that you paid for my sins so that I could have life and that you rose from the dead and overcame death just believing in who Jesus is and who he said he was. And then confessing your sins to God and confessing that Jesus is your Savior and your King. And you can do that right now, just where you're sitting. You can respond to God in that way this morning. And as I've said, it's, it's not far-fetched for us as Christians to believe this because we believe in an all-powerful God. It's not far-fetched to believe in the virgin birth. And that's essentially what the angel points out to Mary next in verse 36. He says, Consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who is called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. 
Then the angel left her. So Mary responds with trust and with surrender to God. She says, I am the Lord's servant. But as exciting as it would be to be a part of what God's doing, as exciting as it would be to be the mother of God's son, you got to wonder at Mary's response. Because this, this pregnancy and this birth would have difficult consequences for Mary. What Mary heard from the angel would have a significant impact on her engagement. It could have drastically altered her plans to get married. And more than that, becoming pregnant during her engagement would bring her great shame from her friends and family. Because especially if Joseph divorced her, the assumption would have been that she had been unfaithful. What really stood out to me this time in studying this passage is the contrast between uh, Mary and Elizabeth. And when we study the Bible, we need to kind of pay attention to those kinds of contrasts. And so, so we see that Mary was young, right? But Elizabeth was advanced in years. We see that Mary was uh, unmarried. Elizabeth was married. We see that Mary isn't barren, and Elizabeth is barren. But in a much deeper way, the, the miraculous birth that God worked in Elizabeth removed her shame from society. But meanwhile, the miraculous birth that God would work in Mary would bring shame upon her from society. Elizabeth's miracle ended her season of waiting. But Mary's miracle began a whole new season of waiting for her. She would have to wait to see if Joseph would still take her as a wife. She would have to wait to see if her family would believe her when she told them the story and explained things to them, and, and it, I'm sure it would have sounded incredibly far-fetched. She would have had to wait to be vindicated from her shame. From that point on, she would have been known as a woman who had been unfaithful during this uh, period of engagement. And even though the angel promises that this child will be great, it would be 33 years until she sees that come to fruition. And if it were me, I'd be thinking, God, if this is you showing me favor, I'm not sure I want your favor. And see, sometimes when God's kingdom comes, it ends our waiting. But sometimes when God's kingdom comes, it brings us into a season of waiting. God never promised that a life of faithfulness to him would be easy. It can involve waiting. And, and many of you are experiencing this. Maybe it's waiting for a spouse. And you've you could have been married by now, but, but you're holding out for a godly man or a godly woman to share your life with so that you can be equally yoked like the Bible teaches. Maybe you're waiting for a career. You could have pursued any career you wanted, but, but you're pursuing a career that God is leading you towards, and it's a difficult path for you. Maybe you're waiting for someone who isn't walking with Jesus to come to know Jesus. Maybe you're being ridiculed for your faith in Christ, and, and your waiting is taking the form of, of standing for truth and waiting to be vindicated by God. Or maybe you're waiting in the form of struggling against temptations that, that before you were a follower of Jesus didn't seem to be a big deal. You never would have thought twice about them. And so some of you might not be able to identify with these things yet, but as we follow Jesus and as we seek to live in obedience to him, waiting comes in many forms. And waiting can come in the forms of trials, and waiting can come in the forms of temptations, and waiting can come in, in different forms of suffering and tension that exists because we're seeking to live a life of obedience to Jesus and faithfulness to him. And what I find fascinating is that Mary doesn't seem to be phased by any of this. Like Mary just completely ignores this. She's not phased by this waiting. I mean, for myself, I hate waiting. Right? And many of you can identify with this. Like, just one quick example. The other day, uh, we decided that we were going to uh, go to the new, new donut shop in town. Um, and so we show up, our family, it was a Saturday morning, just kind of getting out of the house, doing something fun as a family. And, and we show up, and it was like we didn't realize it was the weekend it opened, right? And so we walk in, and there's this line, like, all the way around the store. And if it were just me, I would have turned around and walked out. And I thought about it, but I had uh, two little boys that have been promised donuts and a pregnant wife with me as well, uh, which is a whole other story. So, uh, and so we stayed and waited a half hour, and it was not worth it. 
Like no donut is worth a half hour wait. I'm sorry, it doesn't matter how good it is. And see, I think, I think for Mary, there's a reality that what we are waiting for changes our willingness to wait, right? What we are waiting for changes our willingness to wait. And for Mary, she wasn't phased by this new season of waiting because she understood what was happening here. And she believed the truth that is all throughout the Old Testament and, and seen most particularly maybe in Lamentations 3.25 that the Lord is good to those who wait on him. The Lord is good to those who wait on him. And she believed this and she believed that God would make her waiting worth it. Despite the shame that she would encounter, despite the fact that her obedience and surrender would bring her into a season of waiting in the form of suffering and being marginalized, she believed that God was good to her. And that he would make her waiting worth it. And we too need to believe this. When we experience these seasons of waiting that are brought on by our obedience to God, we need to believe that God will make our waiting worth it. And we see just real quickly, just a few ways in this story that that happens. First, God makes our waiting worth it by overshadowing our waiting with his glory. By overshadowing our waiting with his glory. This grand announcement of the angel reveals the glory of what God's doing in this moment. The glory of the salvation that he's bringing to his people and to the world. And for Mary, that all but overshadows the pain of, well, nine months of pregnancy, right? Uh, that overshadows the uncomfortability of what she would experience. That overshadows the shame that she would experience. And in the same way for us, at the end of this race that we call life, there is a glory that is waiting for us. And that glory is, is, is Jesus. Like at the end of this life, that's what we get. We get Jesus. And, and Romans 8.18 says the sufferings of this present time are nothing compared to the glory to be revealed in us. And although the result of our obedience is that we might experience a form of waiting or even suffering in this life. At the end of this life, we get God, and the glory of that overshadows our waiting. Second, God will make our waiting worth it by using it to bring hope to others. By using it to bring hope to others. God used Mary's waiting to bring hope to the world. And in the same way, when we live out obedience to God, even when that waiting is difficult, it shows the world who Jesus is. It shows the world that there's a better way to be human. When we persevere in faith, despite suffering, despite temptation, despite trials, despite persecution, this demonstrates to the world the hope that we have in Jesus. And, and it's interesting, Gabriel never apologizes to Mary for wrecking her life. She obeys him, and she senses it as an honor. And, and do we have that perspective because God never apologizes for us for the fact that sometimes it's difficult to follow Jesus because it's an honor to bear Jesus through our lives in a way that could bring hope to others. Do we see it as an honor like Mary did? Third, God makes our waiting worth it by accomplishing the impossible in us and through us. Like Mary, the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon us not to bear a child, but to bear the message of this child to a lost and hurting world. Not to give birth to a king that would establish a kingdom on this earth, but to bring the news of this king and this kingdom to the world. And so through us, God does the impossible work of proclaiming the gospel and saving souls. And so our part in that is to trust God and to surrender. And when we consider everything that was at stake for Mary. She still said, God, may it be done to me according to your word. She took the risk to surrender. She didn't say, hey, hold on a minute, angel. I'm going to make a list of pros and cons here and get back to you. She didn't say, hey, let me go call my mom, and then I'm going to come back after I get some advice. She trusted God and willingly obeyed. And, and would we have that same heart? of trust and responsiveness to God, a willingness to obey God even when it makes us, doesn't make us popular, a willingness to put aside our agenda when God has a different kingdom agenda, a willingness to trust that God will use our waiting and redeem our waiting. A modern-day example of someone who lived this kind of life 
is a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He lived in the 30s and 40s when Hitler was rising to power in Germany. He was a German pastor. He was a German theologian. And his most prominent book that he wrote was called The Cost of Discipleship, which is all about what we've been talking about today, all about kind of obeying Jesus, even though it can be difficult and there can be trials, about taking up our cross and following Jesus. And this was kind of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's legacy. Well, another part of his legacy is the fact that when he saw things really going south with, with Hitler and Hitler's treatment of the Jews and, and the genocide of the Jews, he decided it was time to take a stand. And he uh, became part of this plot to remove Hitler from power, to overthrow Hitler. And um, they, they had an assassination plot that they put together and and they put a briefcase on a plane, and, and Hitler uh, was on that plane, and, and he, he, they, they flew uh, somewhere in Europe with that plane, but the briefcase bomb never went off. And so this plot uh, failed a couple different times. It was very close to succeeding. It would have changed the whole landscape of World War II. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer's part in this, sorry, history nerd here, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's part in this was that he was trying to secure a peaceable surrender. He was trying to work with his contacts in, in England and in different places around the world and, and trying to say, hey, if we overthrow the government, will you help us keep our dignity as Germans? And so he had a very crucial role in this plot to overthrow Hitler. Now, when it failed, he became known and he became identified as someone who was a part of it. They didn't exactly know how, but he was just put in prison. Let's put him in prison first and then we'll ask questions later. And so he was in prison from 1943 to 1945. And during that time in prison, it was a season of waiting for him, of waiting to be released, of waiting for Hitler to be overthrown, for Hitler's stranglehold of Germany to end, and most prominently, waiting to see his fiance. He was engaged to be married during that time to a woman named Maria, and he would write love letters to her. And we have many of his letters, and, and for years and years, he would wait to see her. He was executed, though, in 1945, just a couple months before the war ended. And during his life, he would often talk about Advent as the season of waiting. He would talk about Christmas as being kind of like the season of waiting. And he certainly experienced that during his imprisonment. And he said this at one point during a sermon that he wrote. He said, not all can wait. Certainly not those who are satisfied, contented, and feel they live in the best of all possible worlds. Those who learn to wait are uneasy about their way of life, but yet have seen a vision of greatness in the world of the future and are patiently expecting its fulfillment. The celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater to come. In other words, if we are totally and completely satisfied with what this world has to offer, we have no need to wait. But those who learn to wait are those who are uneasy about this life and what it has to offer. And they see a vision of something coming in the future. They see a greater hope and a greater reality. And when I think of that, I think of Mary, who, yes, would go through difficulty, but who had such a clear picture from this angel, such a clear vision of the glory and of the future that was, was to be anticipated as Jesus would come into this world. And we saw that play out. Jesus came as a baby, fully God, fully man, and fulfilled everything the angel said about him. He was that king. He is that king. He was that savior. And he is that savior who took our place for our sins, defeated death, so that we could be saved. She saw a vision of something coming. And I think the analogy of pregnancy is pretty appropriate uh, for me and all of that because, you know, we're, we're just a couple weeks away right now. Uh, we're, we're about nine months into pregnancy ourselves, uh, for Amy at least. Uh, but, but, you know, th there's that verse in John 16 that says that once that, that uh, baby comes, once the labor pains are over, you forget about those labor pains because you've received what you were longing for, received what you were waiting for. At least I know that's true for me. I forget about the labor pains right afterwards. But, um, but when, that, when that waiting is over, and for all of us, we wait in different ways because, yes, God's kingdom has come. And, yes, we celebrate the advent of Jesus, but we expect and anticipate what he will do and the final fulfillment of what Jesus will do in this earth. And so as we wait, we can understand that when the waiting is over, we get Jesus. When the waiting is over. We get Jesus. He's established a kingdom who will never end. He'll be 
the king forever. He'll reign forever. There will be peace on earth. He bought and paid for all of this at his first coming. He's coming soon to fulfill all things. May we wait in trust and in surrender as well. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus and for the the honor of bearing Jesus. That as much as God, we could look at that and see it. um, And we see the pain and the suffering and the shame of what Mary would experience. But God, to be amazed at how unflinching she is and how uh, willing she is to surrender to you and obey you. So God, would we have that same heart in ourselves to worship you no matter what you call us to, no matter what our obedience looks like. And it looks different for each one of us here in this room. But God, we know that you are with us, God, and that there is a future, that there is a glory that is waiting for us. We take comfort in that today. We hold fast to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.